Over the last 25 years, I've had the privilege of interviewing and highlighting some truly interesting people. Everyone who is anyone, both the famous and the infamous, from presidents and their first ladies to kings and queens, movie stars and pop stars, captains of industry, heads of state, sports personalities, innovative entrepreneurs, and some pretty fascinating everyday people. Today, I am proud to introduce you to Professor William Lester Jr., a professor of the Graduate School College of Chemistry, University of California, Berkeley, and Professor Emeritus, whose work has inspired generations of students to love science and strive for excellence. Professor Lester, I am so proud to speak with you today. Just start out by telling us what made you consider a career in science education, sir? Well, let me begin at the beginning. Basically, the idea of uh, science and chemistry in particular was an outgrowth of the days of radio only. Ah. When DuPont had a commercial, Better Things for a Better Living Through Chemistry. This intrigued me. And so it was the case that when I got to high school and I took chemistry, I discovered I really did enjoy the course. And I did very well in it, actually. I used to win competitions like spelling bees where the instructor would line us up, you know, one half of the class on one side of the room, the other half on the other, and then give us questions. And then it was survival of the fittest. And the question is, could you stay in there? And this I did. And it was the case, and I think this is important to know, that I was in uh, high school uh, in Chicago, a rather segregated city when I came along, mm -hmm. in which uh, in order to have a sufficient number of bedrooms, by that I mean, because I had two sisters, and a third one was on the way. And we lived in a two bedroom apartment, parents in one bedroom, sisters and I and in another. Another sister was coming home. Uh, the family decided, and it was clearly a case, we needed to have a situation in which I would have my own bedroom and the three girls would have theirs besides the parents' bedroom. And so this uh, led to our moving up to a project. Mm -hmm. and this was Princeton Park on the far south side of Chicago and uh, went to an elementary school there, which was superior to the one that I was attending through the third grade, closer into the downtown area. Well, the net effect result of this is that when it, I graduated uh, from elementary school, the area high school uh, had had only one previous or two cadres of black students to attend the area high school. Hmm. And so went off there and uh, it was a fascinating experience to say the least. To give you some sense of the proportions, when I graduated, four years later, there were eight of us black students in a class of 365. Wow. Okay. So uh, the aspect of the competition in the chemistry class and being successful and also being successful in other classes. I graduated 15th in a class of uh, 365. Uh, and so it was the case that uh, I was in pretty good shape, I thought, to get some academic support for going on to college. And I applied to the four-year institutions in the Chicago area and was not successful. Mm. So my alternative was to attend the community colleges of the city of Chicago. Mm -hmm. However, it was the case that Calumet High School, the name of the high school I attended, had a librarian who had previously endowed a scholarship to the University of Chicago. Uh -huh. It had been dormant for a number of years, but three in my class were awarded the scholarship a white girl, a white guy, and myself. So that really was uh, sort of where things went. We can talk further about uh, my directions in terms of chemistry, but that's how the chemistry became much more formalized, take, being a chemistry major at the University of Chicago. I understand completely. Actually, my husband has a very similar background. He is from Chicago. Oh, really? Uh, he and his family uh, we're in the Cabrini Green Housing Project and then later in Humboldt Park. And so they're, I'm very familiar with the area of what it is to uh, move up to the projects because there was a time when um, uh, public housing, and I also grew up in public housing, Professor, in New Jersey, public housing was a place where working class families could get a leg up. Yes. And, and it was a community environment. What did that community environment give you, sir? Well, actually, it, it was wonderful in my case. And I should add that uh, Cabrini Green did not exist when I went 
and moved to Princeton Park with the band. It came later. Wow. Talking about, you know, the years and how things evolved. Mm -hmm. Uh, But anyway, your question again was. About the sense of community that um, just that environment can give you um, to help you um, in the future. Sure. Well, one vivid uh, recollection I have uh, is uh, when television came in. Okay. One family, two units down. Now, a unit was uh, eight apartments, okay, in a row, sort of like row of housing in that sense. And we kids would flock down there, you know, howdy doody was new and all that sort of thing. And I look back on that and, and it was a riot. But, but more to the point, uh, you got to know many people, I think, more easily, young people, than you would otherwise. The nature of the organization of these units was such that if you went out the back door, there was this large oh, sort of alley. It was large enough to play football in, this sort of thing. And young people would congregate back there. And there were occasionally larger areas which would flood. And you could even drop a sled on that, that ice in the wintertime and all this sort of thing. Mm-hmm. Besides there being in the central part of the project unit, a large area that the fire department would flood in the wintertime and we would play hockey and skate and all that sort of thing. So in a certain sense, uh, it was great. Let me further add that in terms of the community, the elementary school I went to, the elementary school still has reunions. I love that. Can you imagine? I love that very much. And when I was uh, the benefactor of a lectureship at the University of California, Berkeley College of Chemistry, being created in my name, I heard from a guy who I'd only seen maybe two reunions ago that he had heard about this. It really warmed my heart. Let me get back to chemistry for just a bit. Has sure. there been a central focus of your work um, or is there one area specifically that fascinates you about chemistry? Well, there is one area, <clears throat> excuse me, that fascinated me and was the direction in chemistry that I pursued. And that is theoretical chemistry. When I say to people who don't know much about chemistry, it's clean chemistry. (laughs) What does that mean? Well, we go into our offices and we do calculations. It's molecular quantum mechanics. Okay, you solve equations to learn about the behaviors of atoms and molecules interacting. But how did I get to that direction? Well, it started before I was admitted to the University of Chicago in my senior year at Calumet High School Uh, when guys are saying, hey, man, they're hiring over at the University of Chicago's employment office. So I go over there. They say, well, what can you do? Can you type? I had just finished my junior year, got a little certificate for typing. And so they gave me a test on the spot. Now, I had not been practicing or anything of that sort in the meantime. And so I did 32 words a minute, no mistakes. They said, you're slow, but you're accurate. Mm -hmm. We have two jobs. One is cleaning monkey cages in a medical school at 88 cents an hour. Hear that, hear that money? <laughs> the other is typing in the physics department at $1.09 an hour. So off I go to physics. And in that uh, laboratory, it's called a Laboratory of Molecular Structure and Spectrum, headed by a man by the name of Robert S. Mulliken, who became a Nobel Prize winner some 15 or so years later. Oh, interesting. Uh, they had a typewriter, an electric one, IBM, before Selectric, with interchangeable keys, which included the Greek alphabet and mathematical symbols. Mm-hmm. And this is where I was. And this exposure to this situation and seeing on a daily uh, uh, basis, people come and sit around a table, talk to each other, drink coffee, And in those days, of course, smoke cigarettes, go to the board and talk. I said, what a lifestyle. (laughs) Little little did I know at that that time that these were graduate students and postdoctoral associates for the most part. Uh, Seeing all of that and working with these folks was fascinating. Furthermore, since I was in my undergraduate period dealing with laboratories for general chemistry, then organic chemistry, and then physical chemistry with all the stuff involved there, I said, hmm. This, this molecular quantum mechanics looks interesting, very mathematical. The earliest days of programming were involved, as a matter of fact. The graduate students and postdocs used to have to travel by train to Wright-Patterson Air Force Base in Ohio 
to do their calculations. Can you imagine? Wow. Here we have phones that can do calculations. In those days, people had to get on a train to do one. <laughs> but let me add one further comment because I think it's, it's uh, something which is relevant. And that is that after my first year of undergrad and working in this laboratory, which is where I got my spending chains, folks. I mean, I really needed that. Uh, the man, second man in command there by the name of Clemens Rotan uh, said he was teaching a course to the graduate students that summer and would like for me to sit in on it. And this I did. Now, for people who will see this, they'll have a sense of what I'm going to say. It wasn't something which I doubt that they would fully appreciate. It was in machine language programming. This was before symbolic programming came in. And I won't bore you or anyone else with more of this, but every little step that's associated with an instruction nowadays has many underlying instructions. And those underlying instructions was what uh, Professor Rotan was teaching. After that summer, I said, this stuff is not for me. <laughs> I did not like it at all. In any event, I continued to work and type in that laboratory. And as it would be the case, languages evolved to what are known as symbolic languages. I said, oh, I can do these because they're far more transparent, easier to manipulate and write code. And so that's how I was able to maintain or did maintain my direction of theoretical chemistry. So, um, you know, I, I know that part of being a scientist is to be published, and that is extremely important. So let's talk a little bit about some of the publications you've co-authored, sir. Sure, sure. I have uh, published oh, roughly 250 papers and books and so forth over the years. <clears throat> I understand you've edited several publications throughout your career regarding various scientific topics. Do you have a favorite topic among them? Oh yes, the, the topic I mentioned earlier, theoretical chemistry. And within the framework of theoretical chemistry, it is the uh, calculation of the electronic structure of molecules. Why is it that molecules behave the way they do? It's because of the way the electrons interact with the nuclei in the molecular systems. The other aspect that uh, I was involved in to a great extent was uh, molecular collisions, atoms hitting molecules and things such as inelastic scattering, that is, energy is transferred during the course of the collision so that the molecule might rotate faster, uh, vibrate faster, or reach what we can call an excited electronic state, this sort of thing. That's such a fascinating, uh, long-standing career. I have to imagine, sir, you've been recognized with your, for your work with awards and accolades after such a long and distinguished career. Can you share a few of those with us? Oh, absolutely. Um, I mentioned Nobuche earlier. In 1979, I received their intellectual award named after Percy Julian. You've heard of that name? No, I have not. Okay, he's one of the earliest, most well, well very well known black chemists. Oh. Uh, did a variety of things. Uh, I would say, look, look it up when you have a moment. Yes, sir. Uh, always the professor, always the teacher. <laughs> Always the teacher. <laughs> and in 1986, I received their Outstanding Teacher Award. Uh, since that time, I've been named a fellow, which is a high ranking position in organizations of the American Chemical Society, the American Physical Society, the American Association for the Advancement of Science, the California Academy of Science, and the International Academy of Quantum Molecular Science. Bravo, sir. Bravo. Very small group, this sort of thing. Uh, exclusive group, which was uh, a big surprise, but very nice. And the, the other uh, aspect uh, most recently is this establishment of a lectureship in my name at the College of Chemistry, University of California, Berkeley. We talked a little bit about what role the community played in you growing up, but let's talk a little bit about family. What role do you think that your family has played in your success? Well, clearly my wife, my late wife was invaluable. I mean, she's dealing with uh, two children uh, in the situation when I was going off daily to, to do my research thing and so forth. And uh, she just did a, a fantastic job. And furthermore, 
I, I should add that, you know, after the kids, you know, got older, she went back to doing her professional thing. She was a social worker, had been a social worker at the time we got married, uh, that sort of thing. Uh, just a delightful support. Professor Lester, just please, just to uh, close this up, I'd love for you to share the one thing you'd like the viewer of this video feature to walk away with. You know, I think that the, one of the main things is that um, my path and the success I have had is a consequence by accident of the quality education I had along the way. I think the major thing that people should look at is the improvement of housing and education of people of color in this country. Mm -hmm. And I think there are efforts along those lines all the time, but it needs to be enhanced because we as a country are losing too many good minds as a consequence, not just STEM, but all areas, as I'm sure you recognize. One of my favorite quotes from Malcolm X, which is not one that, it, that a lot of people know, but when talking about education, he said, education is the passport to the future for tomorrow belongs to those who prepare for it today. Yes, yes, indeed. That really does, in fact, summarize um, who you are, what you've done, what you've accomplished, and how it will impact on generations to come. Professor Lester, thank you so very much for your time today. Thank you. It's been a pleasure to meet you and to talk with you. Same here. <laughs>